What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts. So today I wanted to spend some time talking about the problem with plants. Um, something I've talked about a lot in the past, but as always, and thankfully, there are lots of new people coming into this world. I've been working with George St. Pierre this month. He's doing an animal-based diet, feeling really good. Uh, I've been working with Marlon Chito Vera, another UFC fighter at 135. Uh, he's doing great on an animal-based diet. And I think that's bringing a lot of new people into the space. So I wanted to do kind of a review summary of the problem ideologically that I have with vegetables and plant foods in general and the way that I think about this. So when I tell people how I eat, they're always incredulous that I don't eat vegetables. But aren't vegetables super good for us? Isn't this what we've been told for our whole lives? And this is really one of the key tenets of nutrition that I call into question with my work. Now, another friend of mine sent me something from Rhonda Patrick today on her reels. She was talking about a randomized controlled trial. So actually an interventional trial with coffee showing that including coffee in the diet reduced DNA damage by 28%. And there are these studies out there with plant compounds, whether it's whole coffee or blueberries or whatever. And they do show that some of these compounds can reduce DNA damage in situations. And this is often why I think people get confused into saying that these compounds contain antioxidants. But what we must remember is that coffee doesn't contain antioxidants. Coffee contains pro-oxidants, just like the sulforaphane in broccoli that Rhonda also likes. Now, these pro-oxidants then trigger a biochemical system in our body called the NRF2 keep one system uh, and cause NRF2 to dislocate or to dissociate from keep one, translocate to the nucleus as a transcription factor and turn on a bunch of genes involved in our own endogenous, that is our antioxidant response in the human body. So again, all of this I discuss in much more detail in my book, The Carnivore Code, but to say that these compounds are antioxidants is factually incorrect. They're pro-oxidants. And this helps shed light on the concept of these molecules actually being a little bit of poison. It's a concept that's sometimes discussed as hormesis. And if you heard me on Joe Rogan, I differentiated between what I see as molecular hormesis versus environmental hormesis. I'll get to that in a moment. But in, regardless, what we're seeing with these compounds from plants, these many of them are polyphenolic, some of them are isothiocyanates like sulforaphane, is they're acting as pro-oxidants. They're damaging our cells a little bit and they're turning on an antioxidant response. So it's not really surprising that coffee is improving DNA structure or protecting DNA because coffee has molecules in it that are pro-oxidants. And therefore, if it's turning up your body's glutathione, which is our endogenous antioxidant, that is why DNA is generally protected. Now, the question with all of these studies must be two or threefold. The first question we have to ask with these studies is, what is the baseline diet of the people who are being given this coffee? Context matters. I'm gonna hopefully gonna have a gentleman named Stephen, Stephen Van Belay on my podcast soon. He's doing a really interesting randomized controlled trial looking at the effects of red meat in the context of an otherwise, quote, healthy diet that is not the standard American diet. It is one thing to say that coffee polyphenols will protect your DNA if you are eating an animal-based diet, a paleo diet, any sort of healthy, quote, diet that is not the standard American diet. But it's a completely different situation. And this is the situation that occurs in the majority of these trials that coffee is given to people who are eating the standard American diet, that sulforaphane is given to people who are eating the standard American diet. So the question then remains, would sulforaphane really show any beneficial effect by protecting DNA or giving us any more glutathione in someone eating an otherwise quote healthy processed food type diet, would coffee show any benefit? Would it show any DNA protective benefit in somebody eating a healthy non-standard American diet? Would coffee show any benefit to somebody eating an animal-based diet? Would sulforaphane show any benefit to somebody eating an animal-based diet? 
we don't really have the answer to this question, but it's important that we understand the context. Who are the people in these studies? Just like, and uh, Stefan has talked about this on other podcasts, just like the preliminary data shows, red meat is extremely healthy for humans in the context of a healthy diet. Um, red meat is also gonna be healthy for humans in the context of a standard American diet, but that's what we often see as misleading epidemiology, which is why the randomized controlled trials are so important. But the first question that I would ask for any of these studies is, should we do these studies in people who are eating an otherwise healthy diet? If you've read my book, The Carnivore Code, you know I talk about this living a radical life. And going back to the concept of molecular hormesis and environmental hormesis, I talk about the fact that there are many ways to increase your glutathione that don't involve plant compounds, which are plant compounds I would see as molecular hormetics. And there's environmental hormesis, sunlight, exercise, ketosis, fasting. These are all, these are all environmental hormesis. Cold exposure and heat exposure are as well. In my book, I talk about a study with cold water swimmers in Berlin showing that when you go into cold water, that is also an oxidative stressor. That also turns on NRF2 and causes it to dissociate from KEEP1 and increases the amount of glutathione and would then protect your DNA in the same way. So the question that I ask in my work and in the book, The Carnivore Code, is do we really need these compounds from plants if we can get this level of protection of our DNA just by living as we should? also just by eating an otherwise healthy diet. And I am not convinced that we do. Pair that with the other second question we must be asking, which is, so these compounds in coffee also, or sulforaphane from broccoli are turning on NRF2, which is something we can do in other ways. What else are they doing in the body that could be harmful? And that is important to note as well. That so many of these plant compounds that are touted by Rhonda Patrick or whoever also have other effects in the human body that are pretty clearly negative. So forafane from broccoli or broccoli sprouts inhibits iodine absorption to the level of the thyroid. It's a defense chemical. So forafane is weaponized broccoli. So forafane doesn't exist in broccoli or broccoli sprouts until you chew it, until the precursor molecule glucoraphanin combines with the enzyme myrosinase to make sulforaphane. So forafane is a pro-oxidant. It's the plant's effort to dissuade you from eating it. And just because as a pro-oxidant, it turns on the NRF2 system and increases your glutathione a little bit, doesn't mean that it's good for all humans. So I hope that in the future, we'll be able to study these compounds in the context of an otherwise healthy diet and also in the context of an otherwise healthy lifestyle that includes occasional fasting, sunlight, exercise, heat, cold exposure, and I don't know if we'll get the same results. I don't know if it'll be as impressive. And I wouldn't be surprised if they really didn't offer any added benefit. And then we're left with all of their other negative side effects, which are clear and well-documented. Well, what is bad about coffee, you say, Paul? Well, the compounds in coffee, chlorogenic acid, caffic acid, there are many of these polyphenols could potentially damage DNA. This has been shown um, that they actually can trigger DNA damage, at least in uh, assays that look at DNA breaks, which is called clastogenesis. And could they have other effects in the human body elsewhere? Yes. Coffee also contains caffeine, which we know is harmful to humans, even though many of you rely on it. Um, and coffee has other problems. It has acrylamide, which is pretty good case as a pre-carcinogen type compound, mold toxins, pesticides, et cetera. I've done a whole video on my thoughts on coffee separately that you can refer to if you're curious about that. I know coffee touches a nerve with everyone and you don't wanna hear about how I don't like coffee, but I'm using it to illustrate this point that when Rhonda Patrick gets up and I'll just say that I've reached out to Rhonda multiple times, but she doesn't wanna debate. She doesn't wanna have any conversation as far as I can tell. So we'll, I will just have to reference her work respectfully from afar. And she says, coffee protects your DNA. It's not the whole story let's do a study in people who are eating an otherwise healthy diet and see if that really makes any difference. And then let's talk to the hundreds or thousands of people who have given up coffee and seen improvements in sleep, anxiety, and many, many other things in their lives. So that's just an example that's illustrating this concept that we have to think about the context of these plant compounds, the context that they're studied in, and 
the potentially damaging side effects of these molecules. Because remember, plants don't want to be eaten. And when I say that, people always respond, well, animals don't want to be eaten either. To which I then clarify, yes, but animals can run away, kick, or bite you. Plants are stuck in the ground. Think about things from the perspective of plants. They must defend their seeds, especially because these are the reproductive efforts of plants. They must defend their leaves, they must defend their stems, and they must defend their roots. Now, recall that seeds are seeds, nuts, grains, and beans, which is why I recommend most people avoid all of those because they're pretty highly defended parts of plants. And if you can pick a compound from one of those parts of plants and say, aha, look, it protects DNA. Who was it studied in? Were they eating a standard American diet? And what else is that compound doing in other spots in the body that we're not thinking about? Curcumin is a great example of this from turmeric. If you look at curcumin, there are a number of studies that suggest that it's useful in terms of dampening down inflammation. But what else is curcumin doing in a human individual that could be harmful? There are many studies, the dark side of turmeric, uh, dark side of curcumin is one. I've referenced others in my book that show that the molecule of curcumin is foreign to the human body as all of these plant molecules are and can have many damaging negative effects in the human body. So when you're studying curcumin, are you studying it in people who are eating an otherwise healthy diet? Or are you studying it in people who are eating a standard American diet? And are you considering all of the other effects it's having in the human body? And where is the inflammation coming from in the first place that you're trying to get rid of with curcumin? So don't we correct that at its root? So this is the line of thinking that I use when I'm considering plant foods specifically. How toxic are they? How highly defended are they? Is there really anything in there that's beneficial for me? I'm not convinced that there is in the case of these plant molecules, which are so common, so commonly touted as magical. We have to think about context. Have we ever studied them in the context of an otherwise non-processed American food diet? Do we understand the collaterally damaging effects they could be having? And are there any real net benefits from these molecules that we can't get by living well in other ways? And then furthermore, what about all the beneficial, beneficial effects we can get from meat and organs and less toxic plant foods like fruit? So for any of you that are new, think about it this way. The dark side of plants, the challenge of plants, the dangers of plant foods are that plants are trying to kill you. Plants are full of toxins. Plants are full of defense chemicals and plants don't want to be eaten. Do you need these plants in your life? Are they really giving you any benefit? Are you sure of this? Or are they potentially triggering the autoimmune issues you have, the chronic pain issues you have, the libido issues you have, the sleep issues you have, the mood issues you have, the rash you have, the whatever issue you have. That's why I do the work that I do because I want people to understand that if you are eating meat and organs, either fresh or desiccated, like we make it hard in soil for the organs, and you're pairing that with some of the least toxic plant foods, the fruit, the part of the plant that plants actually want you to eat, you're probably gonna get a lot less of these defense chemicals and you might just feel better. And I don't think that when whoever, Rhonda Patrick or whoever comes on and says, this one molecule from coffee does this with DNA, that that's the end of the story. We have to keep asking questions because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, whether it's sulforaphane, whether it's curcumin, whether it's resveratrol, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And that's what I think the danger is with plant foods. So it's not that I think humans should eat no plant foods or that there are not molecules and plants that are potentially beneficial for us, but buyer beware. There are defense chemicals in plants that could be harming you. And unless we understand this and unless we bring this into the forefront of the consciousness with the nutrition, people will continue to suffer. Autoimmune disease, mood issues, sleep issues, whatever. And they'll always be thinking, I need my vegetables. They're the best part of my diet. They're super healthy. I need more broccoli, more broccoli. If I'm not doing well, the answer is more broccoli. Well, it doesn't really work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. It's not just more cowbell. Sometimes you have to think, 
about these compounds and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense they would be so beneficial. So number one, we need to study them in the context of a non-processed food standard American diet. Number two, we need to think about the collaterally damaging effects of these molecules. And number three, we need to understand that we can get these benefits, these supposed benefits, these hormetic benefits by doing things that don't have molecules in our bodies. This is the environmental hormesis piece. So hopefully that helps you guys with regard to plants. Just remember, think about it from the perspective of a plant. Do you really need that in your diet? Is it really helping you? If it's not bothering you, then great, but I'm not convinced that all these plant molecules are so magical. And I think it has to do primarily with the way we study them and our myopia, which means our sort of blinders that we put on to all of the other collaterally damaging effects these molecules could be having. I know this controversial thoughts will be a review for many of you who are familiar with my work, but like I said, there are so many new people in the space now that I wanted to try and lay out my concerns about the dangers of plants. And I hope that'll be helpful. You guys all know that I'm a huge fan of meat and organs. And so if you need more desiccated organs in your life, check us out at heartandsoil.co. I've done all sorts of videos about the benefits of organs in the podcast from earlier this week with Robert English. You heard about all these micronutrients that I think are beneficial that are found in organs. It's tricky for us to get all the nutrients we need as humans. Getting more organs in your life is definitely going to level up in so many ways. George St. Pierre is eating liver every day and heart. I'm getting Chito Vera on more organs as well. And I'm super excited about the way that things like desiccated organs can get these unique nutrients found in these foods to more people uh, more easily. So, all right, guys, stay radical. Till next time.